All right, how's everybody doing out there? My name is Stephen F. Gray II, and welcome back to my channel. Um, um, so this is Friday, and for me it's about 4 o'clock in the morning right now. And this is where I would normally do the study, uh, the teaching on the book of Galatians. However, um, so I do have that one here, but um, <clears throat> we got to do something a little different this morning, and, and there's a reason why. Before we get into that, let's do the right thing, and let's, uh, let's take it to him in prayer. Father, we just come before you right now, and we just want to say thank you, Lord. I thank you for what you're doing in my life, God. Father, I just ask that... You know, you send this video out to touch the hearts of those who, who you intended to reach, Father God. Father, I'm aiming for anybody who wants to hear about Jesus Christ, anybody who wants to hear about my walk with the, with, uh, with the Lord. And Father, for the, for the drug addicts that are out there who are struggling and who currently have some clean time but are struggling, for the convicted felons who are out there, who, uh, who, who just society keeps knocking them down, Lord, and they're feeling like there's like they can't press on and... You know, and, and, and the two entities who just want to revert back to their old way of life. Father, Father, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. Father, shine your light on those people, Father. I thank you. I thank you, Father, because I know there's a victory. Lord, I know there's a victory in, in what you're doing in my life and, and, and in their lives. And, Father, you convicted me this week in some areas of my life, Lord. And, uh, and also uh, in my church service on, on Sunday, Lord, just, you know, where prayer is supposed to be a form of worship, God, and, and not always just all of these requests, gimme, 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 take, take, take. No, Father, I praise you for the work that you're doing in my life. I ask that you would, Father, I ask that you would soften Sabrina's heart, Father God. Father, I ask that one day you would restore my relationship to my three children, Risa, Asser, and Sebastian. Father, I ask that you just bless this, uh, bless this uh, teaching that I'm about to do. Father, I ask that you pour the blood of Jesus Christ over my job, my mind, my heart, my body, and my soul, Lord. Father, not for my glory, but for yours, Lord. I thank you for what you're doing in my life. Father, I also ask that you would just put a blessing on, on Jeff and Melanie. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce their last name because I butcher it every time I do, Father, but they run uh, uh, Cram Christian Recovery for Addiction and Mental Health, Father. Father, I dig what they're doing, Father God. I just thank you for their sober homes, Father, and that hearts are going to be changed through the only thing that does change, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so uh, normally on, on Fridays I do a study on Galatians, and we're going through the book of Galatians, and that's what this is. However, I get to speak on my church's behalf, and, um, and I thought that that was next Saturday. Well, I got a call from the guy who coordinates everything yesterday morning, and he was like, hey, Stephen, don't forget, this Saturday, and I was like, uh, I didn't even have my notes ready. Like, I had, I had most of my notes written down, and so, like, what I was doing was, I got like, okay, this is the Galatians. So I got, like, one Bible study ahead, and, and that's why I've just been really, really busy. Probably the reason why I wasn't seeing things correctly this week. Um, but I had gotten one Bible study ahead. That way I could take this next week. And, and get my notes together for, for this on what I was going to speak for my church. And so when he called me yesterday, or he texted me actually, and I was just kind of like, oh no. So, so, the, uh, so what I'm going to do is, is what I was going to do. We were supposed to do Galatians chapter 4 verses 17 through 31 today. We're going to continue on with that next, uh, next Friday. And I just thought it was fitting because this is the first time I've ever spoken um, as far as speaking on my church's behalf, you know, and, um, and my church is the Cross Brand Cowboy Church in Tyler, Texas. And so I, I've had no time to prepare, you know, like I just found out yesterday morning and, I, you know, I work long hours. Um, so I just, I haven't had any real time to prepare or go over what I was going to say. So <laughs> you guys are going to be my guinea pig. So hopefully I can honor Christ in this. Hopefully I don't stumble too much. Uh, Jeff from Cram. I got myself one of these. I saw you speak and every time I watch one of your videos, you got one of these. It's so much easier. So, you know, of course that was from Jesus, but thank you, he used you. <laughs> so anyway, so if I stumble people, just kind of forgive me because I, I haven't had any time to, to, uh, to really practice uh, this. So uh, anyway, we're just going to kind of get right into it and I'm going to... I'm gonna I'm gonna title this one childlike faith, okay? And I'm just gonna 
I, I can't really envision this being too, too long. Oh, Father, help me please. But I, I'm, I'm titling this one Childlike Faith, and there's a reason for that. So some of you already know a little bit about my life, and so some of this might sound repetitive to you, so just bear with me, okay? So, so my name is Stephen F. Gray II, and I, I've lived a devious, devious lifestyle. I had a, um, my, my mother, Colleen, who every day I have to, uh, I have to acknowledge that she is my mother, and, um, and I have to choose to love her, was, was a very, very abusive woman towards me. Uh, she was mentally abusive, uh, verbally abusive, and, and, and physically abusive. I have scars on my body today from growing up. Now, I endured daily beatings uh, from the hands of this woman, and I was once locked in a room for more than nine months. I, I think it was almost a full year, but it was very, very bad for me growing up. And um, I never understood... I never really understood what love was. I never knew how to accept love. Um, and it just, it, it formed this thing in my mind where like I just, I, I didn't trust anybody. And and I don't want to relive those beatings, you know. Um, but just understand that it was very, very bad for me. She also would force feed me puke, or force feed me food that would make me puke. And I never really... You know, and this comes from my mother, the woman that was supposed to hold me, to love me, to protect me. And I just, it formed this hatred in my mind. It, it formed this hatred. And, and the one man I was, I should have told, was, I, I never told anybody what was going on. Um, but the one man I should have told, which was my dad, Stephen F. Gray Sr. Yeah, awesome guy. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I was always scared because... I, I was always threatened with, like, if you tell anybody what's going on in my house, like, you're dead. Like, I'm going to kill you. And this is what my mother, Colleen, would constantly beat into my brain. And so our house was, it was a little different. Like, it wasn't the average, like, ghetto house. And, and, and I love ghettos. I, I was, you know, I lived in the ghettos most of my adult life. I'm not knocking that if you live in the ghettos. But, you know, we, we always lived in kind of a, a nicer area, you know. It was a facade, and it was like, you know, it, it wasn't that we had, like, you know, the, this great house and this, you know, we, we did move a lot, but we always, the presentation was always that of, of a caring home with, with a loving mother who struggled on her own as a single mother and did the best she could for her kids, and inside of that home, it was very, very different. It was very, very different. Um, my little sister, Rhonda, was openly my mother Colleen's favorite child, and my older sister Belinda endured a lot of the same things that, well, yeah, you know what, it's actually fair to say, Belinda did endure a lot of the same things that I did minus the, uh, the physical abuse. Now, Belinda was hit a few times, and, and when she was, it was usually bad, but it wasn't that often. It was, everything was directed towards me. You know, there was this hate towards her son, and which is me, and I, I could never understand it. And you know, the abuse and the, the 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 name calling, the talking down. It was always like I never I never understood like why this was happening. I you know I had my first suicide attempt when I was ten years old. Um, you know, I, I thought time and time again as a little boy, how can I kill this woman? How can I kill my mother? And you know, it was just very very bad. So, um, so around 10 years old, I, um, you know, or no, I'm sorry. I, I was like, I was somewhere between the ages of 11, 12, and 13. I can't really remember. Well, she kicked me out in the middle of a snowstorm and it was cold out. And I had, I had, um, you know, I had shorts on and it was like, I was freezing cold, you know? And, and, you know, she did this a few times and I wound up calling my dad and I, and I was, you know, I was just tired. I really thought this woman was going to kill me. I feared for my life at the hands of my mother. I lived with the very real, real fear that my mother was intending to kill me, and that is what was going to happen. 
So one day I called my dad after getting kicked out of the house and I'm a little boy and I just started crying and I told him everything that was going on. And he was just like, he was blown away, you know, and he was just like, you know, you know, where are you right now? And I told him and he goes, stay right there. Don't you freaking move. He goes, you call me back, collect in 10 minutes because I was at a pay phone, you know. And uh, so I did that. And he goes, he goes, uh, I still get emotional thinking of it, man. It was like the greatest moment, like one of the greatest moments of my life. I call him back and he goes, he goes, um, he goes, I'm going to be there tomorrow to pick you up. You know, my dad lived 400 miles away. He says, you're going to come live with me. And I was like, for how long? He's just like forever, forever. And I was like, wow, you know, and, and I don't want to get too emotional about that, but, um, you know, so so my mother Colleen knew at that point, like it was just let out of the basket, like, like she knew, you know what I mean. So like I, I so anyway, so she, as promised, the next day, man, my dad rolls up and he picks me up and he was mad, he was mad, and uh, so anyway, so we're driving to, uh, you know, we're driving back to Boston and we stop at a Burger King and. And he's like, well, what, you know, what was going on? Like, what is going on, Steven? You know, and, and I told, I started just telling him, I didn't lay out everything, but I, I told him, like, the beatings and the force feeding the food that would make me puke. And, and I could see in his eyes, like, he never cried, but he teared up. And, you know, and he knew. So anyway, so I go to live with my parents, and I consider my parents my dad and my stepmother, Jeannie. And I have I have three other siblings with them. It's it's uh, my uh, younger sister Natasha, and then my two younger brothers Justin and Jared, who are twins. So at this point now, I'm just wild, 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 wild. I didn't understand what love was. I just I, my mind was so jacked up. I began stealing, lying to them, stealing their money. Um, my parents, even to this day, they own and run a, a bowling league out of Malden, Massachusetts called the Rowdy Bowling League. And I stole thousands, thousands of dollars out of that thing. And so it just became too much for my parents to, to handle. You know, they, they had to send me away, or I think I wanted to go away. And so I grew up, like, I, I grew up, like, like, in foster homes. Um, residential homes for troubled boys. I was always trying to kill myself. You know, I, I spent years as a child in mental hospitals. And, um, you know, it was just bad. It was very, very bad. So when I was, you know, I dropped out of school. So when I was 18, I got kicked out of state care. And then, and then it was on. It was just on. The drug addiction, the this, the that, you know. And I, I got married for a short time. And I had Moino, you know, which uh, resulted in the birth of my my uh, my oldest son, Sebastian, and he's a full-grown adult male now. He wants nothing to do with me, and you know it's it, it's difficult because as Christians, you know we want we want those we want those relationships restored, you know, because we feel that you know they should be, and but we have to look at it from an outside perspective, you know what I mean? So I, I ruined that marriage, and that marriage was just based on sex, drugs, and rock and roll anyway, and I'm not trying to denounce that, you know, I failed to keep the vow to the Lord, you know, in, in marriage, but anyway, and I had this 24 year, it was more than 24 years, uh, uh, just this drug addiction, and this crime spree, like I took what I wanted, when I wanted, how I wanted, you know, Nobody was going to tell me anything because I'm Stephen Gray, you know. Um, you know, this tattoo I have right here, this has a very specific meaning that I don't want to talk about. Uh, I don't normally openly talk about that. It's from my past. I was just a deviant, deviant man, you know. Uh, my best friend uh, is doing 196 years in prison right now, and this is something that I could have been wrapped up, with, wrapped up in myself. And... Um, and so anyway, so I just go on and like my drug of choice was whatever you had. It didn't matter. Now, if I if I had the money and the connect, you know, powder cocaine was my drug of choice, you know. But it didn't matter to me. I loved I I, I had this affair that this this, this uh this deep down passion for mind altering substances, you know. So it didn't matter if it was crack, I'd get crack. If it was meth, I'd get meth. If it was heroin, I'd get heroin. 
uh, the very first time I did heroin, I, I overdosed. Um, you know, and I became I became a seasoned criminal. I was a burglar. You know, I would get or I would get jobs and work my way up into management, and then rob the store. And and it was just I lived like that for more than 24 years of my life. You know, and um, and you know I remember going. I was going to. Uh, I was homeless. I was homeless for many years, and um, you know, I used to run this circuit. They called it, and this was in Las Vegas. And you know, I knew I could eat at Catholic Charities at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then I could go to the Salvation Army, and I could eat at 2 o'clock over there. Then I can go to the Rescue Mission and eat at like you know at 6 or 6:30 over there, and it just didn't matter. I worked my day labor for my dope. That's what I did: day labor for dope. And um, so one day. You know, I'm asking this dude, you know, do you believe in God? And he's like, no. Nah. Anyway, so long story short, it was like, you know, I go and dry out. I found a cement hole behind a McDonald's and, you know, in, in, in a really bad part of town. And I just didn't want the drugs anymore. And uh, so I'm walking, I'm walking after drying out for a few days. It's freezing cold out and, uh, it's, you know, it's winter time. And I see this big blue cross that says, Jesus saves. And I remember just being like, you know, <laughs> whatever dude you know like <laughs> Jesus nah but anyway so long story short I, I wound up getting into their drug and alcohol program and uh, and, and it didn't it didn't work because I, I wasn't really committed to being clean I wanted to be clean I wanted to be off the drugs but I just quickly uh, just started using again now for me in my own personal life I don't like the word for myself I don't like the word relapse because for me it just <laughs> For me, it makes me feel like, well, I relapsed. It, it's just, for me, it's a word that, and I'm not degrading or denouncing anybody who uses that word. Just, I, 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 I wasn't man enough to stand up for Christ and chose to use over a relationship with him. That's how I prefer to, uh, uh, to say it. So anyway, so it took me a lot of times going back to rehab, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and, uh, and you know, I just, I just had this, I had this, you know, this up and down roller coaster ride with mind altering substances, and um, the the best way that I can explain it is like if you're married, like the love that you have for your husband, or the love that you have for your wife, or the, even the love that you have for your children, that is the kind of love that I had for dope and for drugs and for any mind-altering substance. It's the, the best way that, that, that I can explain it. Now, I finally, I finally got clean and, and I had some clean time and I got a job at an oil company and, and things seemed to be going well. I, was the, you know, I worked my way up. I was the plant manager of the oil company. We did an annual revenue of like more than $500 million and things were all right. And, but the more I worked, the less my I had of uh, the less of a relationship I had with God, and uh, and Jesus Christ, and um, so I got married, and um, and I just, I quickly went right back to the dope. And for me, this is how, and this wound up. I, I forget the exact time, but it had to be. Uh, um, I want to say six or seven year. Uh, relapse or you know what I mean if you will um, I was on a county baseball league you know and I, we were sponsored by the oil company I was about to get married you know everything is great dude and I and I broke my leg and uh, and I broke it in like three spots like it, it was a bad bad break and it was I uh, you know I, 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 I it was bad and I had to have two different surgeries and it, it all started with the pain medication and the pain medication quickly turned to alcohol. The alcohol, I'm sorry, the pain medication quickly turned into the leftover wine because this happened like seven weeks before I got married. And so the pain medication from the surgeries quickly advanced to drinking on the honeymoon. When we got back, that advanced to drinking all the wine that was left over from the wedding, which turned into dope. And I, I just went on like, it was, oh my gosh, what was that? Like another six, seven, eight year drug run. And I destroyed my marriage to my ex-wife, Sabrina. I destroyed my relationship to my two younger children. 
And then, so like when I finally decided to get clean and, and put everything down, I had caused so much damage. I had caused so much damage that nobody believed me, nobody wanted me, nobody trusted me. You know, it, it, it didn't matter. And, and, you know, we can sit here as Christians, right, and we can sit there and say, well, that's not right, and we need to do the right thing, and, you know, restoration of relationships, and people need to forgive, and what about when it's you? I'm not saying it's right, but what about when it's you? Can you say the same thing when it's somebody that's hurt you? Now, I agree that like a lot of these struggles that I'm dealing with right now shouldn't be for the simple fact that I'm dealing with these struggles with other people who call themselves Christians, but it's free will. And I wouldn't be dealing with those things if, if, I, if I hadn't caused so much damage. So I can't, I can't expect for like the world to stop and for everybody to forgive Stephen, you know, because my mind is different, because I love Jesus. The world is still the world, you know? And when things weren't going right, and, and I was like, this is when I knew that God had a plan for me. I had just, you know, I was, I was trying diligently to see my kids, and my ex-wife was being, I don't want to say devious at this point, because at this point I believed that Sabrina was just scared. And, um... I believe she, I actually believe she was legitimately scared at this point, but this is after I had gotten arrested and, and all this other stuff, and I was just like, you know what, it ain't worth it, dude. Like, I'm going to kill myself, you know, and I had had, I, I had just bought a brand new car. I had, you know, a lot of credit cards. My credit score was like, you know, like really awesome, and I just said, screw it, man. You know, I, I'm not doing this. I'm going to kill myself, dude. And uh, so I went to, I remember going to the banks, dude, and I did cash advances on like all of my credit cards and I did, I got all the cash I could get and it was somewhere over like $7,000. And, uh, and I bought $5,000 in powder cocaine and uh, like $2,000 in Miller High Life and I tried to drink and snort every single bit of it. I was doing lines on my coffee table, like three feet long and I'm not trying to tell war stories. The point I'm trying to get at is I tried giving myself a heart attack. I legitimately tried to kill myself. You know what happened? I wound up like like my chest, like I, I, I was having a heart attack. And it was the first time I said, praise God, in a long time, man, because I knew I was dying. Yeah, praise God, man. I woke up to the birds chirping. I said, man, you got to be kidding me, man. Are you serious? I knew that God had a plan for me. That was September 14th, 2014. This year will mark uh, 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 seven years since that date. And through all of my struggles, like I can tell you, uh, injustice after, in since that point, injustice after injustice after injustice after injustice, and the struggle, and living out of storage units, and trying to work, and I can't live because I pay child support, you know, and my paychecks were like thirty-five to fifty dollars. You know, every two weeks, and I had a break, and and all everything that happened after that, right? Dealing with all of that, best thing that's ever happened to me in my life. The best thing that's ever happened to me. Well, no, I'm sorry, second best because Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, Lord, forgive me. Jesus Christ, the best thing that happened in my life. But trying to struggle through and maintain a life after causing all of that damage doing it while clean and persevering with a fresh felony conviction it just created this this thing in me to where like 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 I'm gonna stand I'm gonna stand you know like I'm gonna get back up and I'm gonna fight I fought really hard for the dope I fought I, I if I wanted it I made a way homeless not work and no money but when I wanted dope I had dope and I'm not talking about, you know, there's probably some people like, oh, oh when's those times happen? You know what I'm talking about, dude. And, that, and that's the enemy, you know. I was going to put that dedication into Jesus Christ. And I still today don't have most anything. Well, uh, I still, I, out of everything I destroyed, I have like less than probably like 1% back, you know, and... 
But these were the best times of my life. It was God forming me and shaping me into the man that he wants me to be. Ecclesiastes 7.3 says, Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance the heart is made better. That first part was more of a testimony. So, you know, there's something about sadness that puts things in pers uh, into perspective for us. Not only just feeling sad sometimes stir up emotions we don't normally want to feel, but, we're in the, but when we're in that moment of sadness, I think we're able to see things a little more than if we were than if we weren't sad. Sadness also brings us closer to the Lord, as He wants us, in our own words, to put our hearts to Him. You know, God created emotion, and I truly believe that sadness is one of those things to where, like, maybe if we're not right, if we're not doing the right thing, I believe, I know this is right for me in my life, that God has just kind of allowed some of this sadness to come, you know, so one, we can feel it, you know, two, it, it puts us in a perspective, you know what I mean? At least it does for me. I'm not, I'm not talking about being sad all the time, but those moments when we're just like, like just really like, man, you know, maybe God, and I don't know if this is scriptural, I gotta check with Robert, he's my, uh, my Bible study mentor, but, um, you know, God can put these things in our lives to make us feel sad, to bring us to our knees, you know what I mean? And I love this quote here, it says, Tears are words that need to be written. And that's a quote by uh, Paulo Cielo. I love that. Tears are words that need to be written. So, like, I love to write. You know, I really do. I, I, I love, love writing. I wrote one book, and I, you know, I'm in the middle of writing a second book right now. But I just, when I read that, I really loved that quote. I really, really did. Um, Revelation 2.11 says... He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And I love that. Listen to the second line of that again. This is, our, again, Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. That's pretty cool, huh? You know, we all have eternal life. It just depends on where we're going to spend it. We're, we're all going to live forever. But you're either going to live forever in the lake of fire and burning sulfur. Or we're going to be in paradise with Christ. This thing with God, this thing with Jesus, it's not a joke, people. Our lives, our eternal destiny depends on this. And it's not even that I just believe this. I mean, I do believe it, but it's, it's the truth. It's the truth. I love this quote by C.S.L. or yeah, C.S.L. <laughs> C.S. Lewis. There are only two kinds of people in the end: those who say to God, "Thy will be done," and those to whom God says, "In the end, Thy will be done." All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there would be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Listen to the last line of that quote again. I love CSO Herbs. <laughs> C.S. Lewis. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Hell is a choice. You know, people want to sit there and say, well, how can a good God, you know, allow so much pain? And, you know, what about the woman who gets raped and the child who commits suicide or the, the little boy that's constantly beat? Or the child that now has a damaged mind because the ex-wife or ex-husband won't let the former spouse see the kids. and I don't have an answer for a lot of those questions, but I will say it comes down to free choice. Think about your choices. Is God involved in every single one of your choices? Do you call on him for every one of your choices? Every one of your decisions is Jesus Christ involved in? If not... Now think of those decisions and choices that you've made without the counsel of the Almighty. Did any of those choices hurt somebody? It's free will. This is why it is so important to have that constant communication with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is why it is so important 
to be in the Word of God, studying His Word and praying. We need to have that relationship. In Genesis 1, God repeatedly affirms that all of His creation is good. And in Genesis 1.31, He calls it very good. Now, while creation had been mod and distorted as a result of sin, it is still good in the hands of God and serves his, it serves his very purpose of pro proclaiming His glory in the world. Now, all of us, you and me, should affirm and seek to persevere the goodness of God's creation, which is stated in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, which says, The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. One of the things I was going to be talking about when, I, uh, when I'm allowed to speak for my church uh, this Saturday is Psalm 1. You know, and I'm going to read the whole psalm. It's only six verses. But Psalm 1 is titled, at least in the CSB version, it's titled The Two Ways. How happy is the one who does not walk in the, in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway of sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction. And he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in the judgment. I'm sorry. Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteousness of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. And that was uh, verse 6. I'm going to read verse 6 again. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. I was listening to a sermon uh, maybe about a month ago. And it was talking about like when God is ready to bring you to a new level of spirituality... And a new, uh, a new spiritual connection with him, he will regularly do in the midst of conflict. He will, I'm sorry, he will regularly do it in the midst of conflict and confrontation. I didn't say all the time. I said regularly. The Egyptians prayed, and prayed to be released from Pharaoh as slaves. Then blamed man Moses. I'm sorry, I like jacked that up. And then they blamed man Moses. Moses prayed to God, praying to God, God used Moses to answer their prayer, and they blamed Moses. The biggest miracle was potting of the Red Sea. God will fight for you while, he is, while you are silent, not while you are complaining. I love that. God will fight for you while you are silent, not while you are complaining. Just move forward. Faith is in your feet, not your feelings. Faith is in your feet. Not your feelings. Fear immobilizes. Faith moves. Why does God put you in a dilemma when you're in his will? So you can see something. When they saw the power of the Lord, they encountered God's power. Sometimes it's easy to get used to yesterday. And then when today goes bad, you want to go back to yesterday. God is trying to deliver you out of that yesterday into a brand new tomorrow. And he's trying to do that with him. He's trying to bring you with him. That new tomorrow with him is foreign to you. Thus it's uncomfortable. Hence the conflict and confrontation in moving forward in Jesus Christ. See, and that's the part that I really have to study because I know I fumbled over that. I'm really, really sorry. I'm going to end it with this. I have a little story. This is why I titled this one Childlike Faith. Now, when I was at the rescue mission, my mentor pastor, Pastor Jeff Chavez, who he is the pastor of Church Online, and it's spelled C-H-R-C-H. 
And why, that, their little thing is like, well, where's the you? Well, all that's missing is you. Church online, that's their kind of little thing. But anyway, so Pastor Jeff, he, um, his daughter, Jessica, um, his daughter, Jessica, when she was a little girl, used to watch uh, Pastor uh, her dad preach the sermon. So we're all homeless. We're either homeless or we're in the, the drug and alcohol program at the rescue mission. And I remember I, I could for years, I couldn't get this, this, this vision out of my head because he would occasionally read poems from his daughter, Jessica, on stage, right? And... And the, the, they were always about God. Pastor Jeff, if, when he was, well, his whole life, like, he, I mean, he's about God all the time. But, like, it, the point I'm trying to make is he just wasn't reading something cute. You know, he wasn't just reading something cute from his daughter. Oh, it's something cute from my daughter. Let me read it out. No, dude, that was church time. So I do know that everything that Jessica was writing was about God. You know? And I remember, like, looking over, and I just, I couldn't understand it. And here's this little girl, and I wish I had a chair, but she would, like, she would like, you know, swing her feet back and forth and, you know, this big smile looking at her dad, you know. And I remember like, like I would just look at her, right, and just be like, for some reason my heart was breaking and I couldn't understand it. You know what I mean? I, I couldn't understand what God was trying to show me. And the first thing I thought of was, wow, she's like totally not afraid of her parents, you know what I mean? Which is, you know, and, and I was never afraid of my dad, but... Just understand, like, I knew that Jessica had a loving home. You know, and this is not to take away anything from Pastor Jeff's other, th other three children, Jeff Jr., Dustin, and, and Grace, but it was like this situation with constantly watching Jessica look at her dad, who was Pastor Jeff Chavez, I, just, I, 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 couldn't, I, I couldn't just, God was speaking to me something through it, man, and I couldn't understand it. And this is a memory that, that just, it, it, I don't want to say it, it ate me up, but it tore me up for 17 years. Because I just understood last week what all that was about. And it was about childlike faith. It was about childlike faith. And I have no doubt in my mind. And I point this way because I remember that because the guys had to sit on this side and the women and children. And then it was always, you know, it was always... Um, um, uh, Pastor Jeff's wife, Miss Peggy, and, and Jessica. And it's like, this girl had the childlike faith because she knew that Pastor Jeff was going to lead her the right way. There was no doubt in Jessica's mind that this is how it was. And that's how we're supposed to look at God. You know what I mean? You know, one of my favorite verses is, is, is Luke 9.62. He who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for service to the kingdom of God. Why are we going to put our hands on Jesus Christ to follow him if we're only going to double check ourselves? And that's what this whole thing with Jessica was. And it was like, it took 17 years. 17 years that this thing with her poems and it, like I couldn't like, it's this childlike faith, people. We have to hold on to God. We have to hold on to him. We have to, we have to, we have to, we have to. In the same way that Pastor Jeff's wife and his children had no doubt that they were going to follow or that Pastor Jeff was going to provide, you know what I mean? And, it, and it's, Pastor Jeff, he, he's a man, he's a human. I'm not holding Pastor Jeff up here. The point I'm trying to make is that is how we have to see God. How Jessica looked at her dad for 17 years, God was trying to tell me, this is how you need to look at me. At me. Nobody else. Me. I provide. I give. I take away. And I'm so happy because it's funny because, like, since last week, I haven't thought once about, once about that until... Because I wrote this... Uh, I wrote right here at the bottom... Pastor Jeff reading Jessica's poems. And I wrote that here like a month ago because that, that, that still rented space in my head. And that's something I had thought about, I don't want to lie and say every week, but I guarantee you at least a couple of times a week for 17 years, I thought about that. 
<laughs> and sometimes it's so simple. Thank you, God. Ah, you're awesome. Anyway, listen, we're going to close it out right now, okay? So before we do that, we got to do the right thing and take it to him in prayer. After the prayer, uh, I got something I just want to touch up on. Father, we just come before you right now, and I just want to say thank you for what you're doing in my life, Lord. Father, if there's anybody out there right now, Father, who wants to give their life to Jesus Christ, I just ask that they put their heads down right now and just repeat this prayer. Father, I am a sinner. This way of life isn't working. Today I put my faith in you. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe that you raised him up on the third day. Father, help me in my faith. Father, I believe, help my unbelief. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Father, I just thank you for this time that I've allowed to have online. Father, I pray that this video just go out and reach and touch the hearts of those that you wanted to reach, Lord. Father, this childlike faith that we need to have, I ask that you just spread that specifically to anybody who watches this, Lord. I thank you for the work that you're doing in my life. I praise you for my uh, trials. I praise you for my struggles. I love you, Lord. I need more of you and less of me. And Father, I thank you for the sports band that I'm about to go on. Yeah, I love it. You're awesome. Amen. So, like, if anybody doesn't know, I'm going on a sports band after this weekend because, like, I mean, come on, dude, seriously. And I have, like, more sport. Like, no, nah, dude, guys, like, pfft, no, stop, dude. Those are idols, homie. Stop. So I'm going on a sports band. Anyway, in the description box below, I'm going to, again, I say this in all of my videos, this doesn't work if you don't watch the video. In the description box below is going to be uh, the, uh, the link to the song, the More I Seek You by Carrie Job. And I do this because the more you seek him, the more you're going to love him. Also, for any drug addicts that are out there, convicted felons having a hard time, I also linked Cram, C-I-A-M, well, I'm from Boston, C-R-A-M, which is Christian Recovery for Addiction and Mental Health. That's in the description box below. Also, I'm going to have the links to my social media outlets if you want to follow me on any of those. Also um, is going to be um, also is going to be the link to my email address. I ask that you send me your prayer requests. I have a small team of people. Uh, one of them being my mentor, Pastor Pastor Jeff. The other one is my me my Bible study mentor, Robert. Uh, another one is my friend Kale, who occasionally picks me up for church. Good family man. And uh, and then Jeff. Uh, I'm sorry, dude. Chaisa, I'm butchering your name. Anyway, he's the director of CRAM. Uh, he's actually in charge of the, of the recovery thing that I, I linked in the description box below. Um, and just on a side note, so everybody knows, I just finalized all the paperwork last night. I, I spoke about this yesterday in my uh, video. I finalized the paperwork um, for Barnes & Noble. So as soon as, uh, as soon as everything is good, I'm going to let you know uh, when you can walk into a Barnes & Noble and purchase my book. Yeah, they're just the formatting took a while and whatnot, whatnot. Anyway, that's all just kind of like you know, uh, red tape. Um, but yeah, so I completed all that last night. The cover was uh, formatted, and uh, yeah, so that's that. Listen, for the people who just gave their lives to Jesus Christ, this thing is not a joke. You need to have that childlike faith and do the best you can to keep that childlike faith throughout your entire walk with the Lord. It'll change your life, man. It's going to be the best thing you ever did. It's more than just saying the words, though, okay? You can't just say the words and then, oh, you're saved. No, it don't work like that, dude. I encourage you to get with a trusted member from your church, a pastor, an elder, not somebody who's been, you know, reading the Word of God for like five days, okay? I'm just saying. That's kind of like my stance on that. Um, also, if you're a man, you need to get with a oh, I'm sorry, well, I rebuke that. If you're a man, you need to get with another man, okay, to counsel you through this process. If you're a woman, you need to get with a, uh, 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 an elder woman from your church to help you in this walk with Christ. This is how this works. Sexual, um, what am I trying to say? Yeah, just keep it within the same thing. You know what I mean? All right, so that's all I got. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Uh, Monday, 
I will be back with the uh, devotional reading that I'm doing called Still Standing. Next Wednesday, we'll, be, uh, we'll continue my Crawling to God series. And then next Friday, we are going to pick up again in the book of Galatians where we were supposed to uh, be today. Uh, so that'll be uh, Galatians chapter 4, verses 17 through 31. And uh, like always, please bring your Bibles next Friday. Thank you very much. Have a great night.